Okay, welcome back everybody. Thanks for joining us on this journey we're going to make through Tefillah and the Sidor. We're continuing um, this year from last week, basically. Last week we began with an introduction to Jewish liturgy. Essentially what that meant was that we were going to um, introduce studying Tefillah and the various approaches that we have for studying tefillah. So there's, of course, the halachic approach. There's the um, theological approach to studying tefillah and all the machshava. There's commentary. And finally, there's the academic work. And we went into the background of all of this study and all the various ways we could approach the sitter. Tonight, I want to approach the concept of the sitter itself. I want to study how the Siddur came to be, an early history of the Siddur, and to clarify the origins of the Siddur, at least the concept and the construct of the Siddur as we know it today. And this is not going to be a class where we're going to go through uh, six million different um, versions of the of the sitter and every different printing and in this year it was printed in that city and in this year it was printed in that city and this one affected this one and this one affected that one. First of all, in my opinion, that's kind of boring. Um, it, and honestly, it would take us ten hours just to get through every single printed sitter that ever existed. So, in my opinion, this the wisest thing to do would probably be to study the concept of the sitter to study the early history of how the sitter developed and to come away with a better understanding of both the physical book and the construct of a sitter. So for this, we are going to begin with the word itself. The word, as um, many people know, Samach Yod Dalet Bav Reish, comes from the Hebrew word for seder, which is actually originally Aramaic. And that word is just another word for the Lashon Kodesh of Arach, to, to order things. And Having a sitter presumes that you have a seder. That's just beyond obvious, but sometimes you have to actually speak that out loud. If we have a sitter hatfila, that means you have a seder hatfila. And understanding that there is a sitter or a manual for this seder hatfila, this order of the tfila, um presupposes that there is a seder hatfila. So, in order to understand how the sitter came to be we have to first see how the Seder Hatfila came to be because the, the first generations were the generations where a Seder Hatfila uh, created and affected um, and evolved into the Siddur. And then much later, we have a generation in the modern era where the Siddur becomes the primary driving force of shaping Jewish liturgy and shaping um, the Tfila and worship as we know it today. First, I would like to actually define some terms, if everyone could see. Um, when I say a prayer, as we discussed last week, prayer can mean so many different things. There's so many different, different types of prayer. Um, but I think the gist of the English word is understood among most people. When it comes to a liturgy, a liturgy is, is a fancy word for a seder hatfila. It means a rite or a body of rites prescribed for public worship. So when you have a, a, when you have a full-bodied um, uh, set of tefillahs, of prayers that come together, like uh, like the way we do shachris, where you have the Berchsa Shachar, and you have Pesikut Zimra, and you have an order and a procedure for doing one, and then Kaddish, and then this, and then that. We have a whole procedure for how you do your set of prayers or your set of rituals together. We call that a liturgy. Okay, so now, how are we going to find out when the first time was that the Jewish people had something that we could call a liturgy? Something that we could say, this is a defined set of prayers that were put together for the sake of worship. So as far as we know, before the Churban Bayashani, before the destruction of the Second Temple, we have very little information about how worship was done both in private and in public. We don't have any evidence whatsoever about there being a fixed liturgy, neither in text nor in nor not, neither in, in the fixity of its text, nor can we say that in the fixity of a Seder Hatfila. We just don't have any evidence to support that there was a Shemayna Esrei, that there was a Kriya Shema, and then the Birchus Kriya Shema, and, and a Seder of Shachris. We don't have enough information. Sure, we have Tfilais, we have various prayers. Sure, we have Midrashim that tell us X, Y, Z, but we don't actually have any evidence that there was a Seder Hatfila, that people would wake up 
um, and then pray uh, in, in a specific order of prayers for their daily worship, that they had a statutory prayer. We just don't have any evidence of that before Bias Shani. And so tonight we're going to have to look at all the evidence we have post Bias Shani, which give us some idea of how the liturgy as we know it came to be. And I'm not just talking about fixed texts, like the composition of fixed texts. I'm also talking about the idea of making a set order of prayers that were statutory for everybody to say together. Of course, there are many layers to this. Not only is there a layer of having fixed texts and having um, an order, not only is there a layer of having a fixed text and having an order of prayers, um, there's also the idea, and there's also another layer about whether or not there was communal prayer. Was there the requirement for a minion? Would people get together? If they did, where did they get together? Would they do it in the street? Would they do it in the base of Medrash? Would they do it in the base of Knesses? The early evidence we have for ha what Bate Knesseis were seems to be that Bate Knesseis were places of assembly, like a town hall. We actually don't have um, sh uh, strong evidence before the third century that a base of Knesses was used for tefillah. It seems that only after the third century and further but the Knesseis were used exclusively for tefillah at the very earliest. And therefore, there's it's this is a very multi-layered question. When were the earliest, when is the earliest evidence we have that the Jewish people uh, created a liturgy, a set of prayers that were intended for worship, whether this is intended for private prayer or communal prayer, but when, historically speaking, were most people observing a statutory prayer. So the crux of this investigation begins with a Gemara in Brachas and Davchav Ches Amid Beis. This Gemara and this Mishnah together form the crux of a very complicated argument, which involves Mishnahs, Brisois, Teseftois, and so many uh, components that we will not be able to digest all of it tonight. And what we're going to do is, of course, only focus on this argument as it comes to the Shemina Esrei, and later we're going to stress more on the various tefillahs when we go through the sitter. But this Mishnah here that you're looking at is about the Shemayin Esrei. Rebbe Gamliel Leimer, Bechol Yayim V'yayim Espalo Adam Shemayin Esrei. Rebbe Gamliel says, every day a person uh, prays 18. Rebbe Yeshua Aimer, Me'ein Shemayin Esrei. You could do the abbreviated Shemayin Esrei. Rebbe Kiv Aimer, Im Shugur Etfiyasa Befiv, Espalo Shemayin Esrei, Vim Lav Shemayin Shemayin Esrei. Lastly, Rebbe Leezer says, Aimer Ha'aisa Tefillasai Keva, Ain Tefillasai Tachnunem. So what do we learn from this Mishnah? We learn it appears that there are two versions of Shemayin Esrei. And that there is such a thing as the Shemayin Esrei. There is an ordered set of 18 brachas. In the time of Rabbi Gamliel, who lived in the 2nd century, there is something called the Shemayin Esrei. There is also an abbreviated form. Whether or not it had, we don't see whether or not the Shemayin Esrei brachas had, had a nusuch, but we definitely see that there was 18 brachas in an order. Finally, finally Rabbi Yezer at the end of the Mishnah says, you should never have a fixed text. Fascinating. That's not a good tefillah. Rav Yasef, one of the Meiroim in the Gemara, actually understands this to mean literally. People shouldn't use fixed texts. Fixed texts become boring. They become monotonous. They become rote. People should uh, people should create a, a, a culture of variation, and they, they should create a tefillah, which is exciting and has more artistic... Uh, components to it and should have more variation to keep the Kal excited. But that's just the Mishnah. But the Mishnah itself is a, is, is a little bit complicated because it's missing some words that would be very helpful. But then comes the Gemara. And the Gemara here is in a in a, in a discussion about Birchas Haminim. Says the Gemara, Tana Rabbanon, we learned in Ebraisa, Shimon HaPakolis Hister Shimon Esrei Brachos Lefneir Megamliel Al HaSeder B'Yavna. Shimon HaPakoli, Shimon maybe, whatever that means, Pakoli maybe a flax, flax maker, there's all sorts of different uh, uh, ideas thrown out there. A person named Shimon HaPakoli, who is not called rabbi, arranged the 18 brachas before Abigam Liel according to their order at Yavne. The rest of it is the story of Birch Saminim, how Abigam Liel asked somebody to fix the Birch Saminim. What does this tell us? This price here tells us that Rabbi Gamliel at Yavne created a huge institution. He said, we are going to institute the 18 brachas al Haseder. So the way this is understood in comparison with the Gemara and Megillah uh, Daf Yud Ches, very basically, is that there was a concept of 18, at least 18 different brachas that existed 
before Rebbe Gamliel's time. However, Rebbe Gamliel was reinstituting them because something had been forgotten, whether it was the correct order or the correct nusach, something had been forgotten. Most, most um, Rishayinim understand this to mean that the order had been forgotten. The Anshi Knesset Hakadayla had come along at the end of Bayis Rishayin, and they said there is such a thing as a statutory prayer, the Shmein Esrei, and it should have this amount of brachas: eighteen. First, you do avais, then you do gvurais, then you do then you do um, kedushais, then you do das. The eight, here's eighteen brachas in their order. But that nobody had used it during Bayesheni because they had the base of If there was the base of Mikdash, nobody was using Shemayin Esrei. They didn't need statutory prayer. They were, they were bringing the karbanas, so private prayer was good enough. But after the korban Bayesheni, or Gamliel had to reinstitute something, and he had to um, create the Shemayin Esrei again. So the question is exactly what was exactly what was Rabbi Gamliel doing? Was he fixing a new text here? Was he saying, okay, everybody needs a nosach, and the Jewish people had just went through a period of upheaval. Everybody just uh, our entire system of religion, our entire religion just went out the out the window. Rabbi Gamliel was faced with a crisis. Here's here's by Shani, Here's the korban. The entire Jewish people were destroyed. Were the entire Jewish religion is destroyed without the without the bias? We have to recreate Judaism from the inside, and we have to create a religion. We have to to create a religion based on Torah, not on not on uh, just the value of the base of Mikdash. And therefore, he understood the need for a fixed liturgy and a fixed worship. And therefore, one could learn, as Ezra Fleischer does, that Rabbi Gamliel was coming to be misakin a fixed text for the Shemayin Esrei, and that was what Shimon HaPakoli did for him. That's one view. The other view, uh, and and th- uh, I should mention that this view presupposes that this text should be taken literally, this Gemara should be taken literally, and then every subsequent Shemayin Esrei that you find, which is not according to the main text that Shimon HaPakoli made for Ibn Gamliel, this, this, this Nusuch that he created for Ibn Gamliel, Every single one after that is a corruption. So if you find a Nusuch HaYushalmi that's not like the Nusuch HaBavli, the Yushalmi's messed it up with their Paitanim. If you really did the homework or you had a time machine, you'd be able to go back to Yavne, where Begum Leel did this t- institution, and you'd be able to find an authentic text that Begum Leel made for the Shemayin Esrei, showing us, according to Ezra Fleischer, that a fixed liturgy, at least for the Amida, did exist at, at the time of Begum Leel Yavne in the early 100s. That's a fascinating thing to claim. And we, of course, at this time, we don't know about the other parts of the prayer, but we do know that this statutory prayer was set. Now, this is a very problematic thing to claim. First of all, Yosef Heinemann, Rabbi, Rabbi, Rabbi Yosef Heinemann, who had his smicha from the mirror before Fleischer, um, was arguing, and this was the main, uh, this was the main argument, uh, this was the main uh, d- d- difference between him and him and Ezra Fleischer, that the the philological method of peeling away layers to finding the original text was not, n- no such thing ever happened. There was never an original text of Shemayin Esrei. There was no, never an original text of any of the main brachis. Originally, different social uh, groups of Rabbanim and different social groups of different types of Jews created their own versions and eventually enough overlapped, enough homogenized, and enough themes of forms came to be that the best ones were chosen and the best ones were elected and the best ones got retained in the tradition and in the Talmud Bavli. That's his approach. And there's a lot of support for this in Talmud Bavli. Now this is, the, and that's why it was such a, such a honestly bitter fight between various scholars of Jewish liturgy when Ezra Fleischer came out with this, uh, with this new Chiddush, because this, what we have here in the Gemara doesn't immediately support what, what Ezra Fleischer is saying. He wants to say that the logical conclusion is this 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 Gemara, this price is telling us that a, a Nusach was fixed. It must be a Nusach was fixed. What else was he going to do? That we already had some idea of a Shemayin Esrei, uh, or um, we don't have any evidence, Fleischer's language actually is, we have no evidence that a Shemayin Esrei ever existed before Yavna, which again is another, <laughs> a whole another can of worms. And and this is a whole new Nusach. But this area, the, just making that claim is very problematic. We have a Tesefta in Rosh Hashanah, which mentions the Machlekes between Beis Shammai and Beis Hillel, where they're arguing about how many brachas are said on the Tefillahs of Mayadim and the Tefillahs of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. So they're counting how many brachas are said in the Shemayin Esrei. Do you have seven? Do you have nine? And how could Beis Shammai and Beis Hillel be arguing about how many brachas there are in the Shemayin Esrei if there was never a Shemayin Esrei? Beis, Beis Shammai and Beis Hillel lived uh, at least 100 years before um, before Rabbi Gamliel B'yavna. There must have been a concept of a fixed 18 brachas before Rabbi Gamliel B'yavna. So this, 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 um, what's the word? 
this Brysa, this 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 history that the Bryce is giving us there, Rigam Liel is the first one to be Mesak in the Shemayna Esrei, and nobody was doing it prior. That's not historical. It can't be historical. It cannot be understood on its on its face value. Rigam Liel must have been aware of a of a of an eighteen brachas or a set of amida that was that was created before his time. So we cannot take this at face value and assume that Rigam Liel was the first person to be Mesak in the Shemayna Esrei. There must have been a form, an amida, a Shemayna Esrei, so to speak, before. Rabbi Gamliel. So, were there any fix, fixed texts? What can we glean about? What can we glean? Someone's posting something in the chat. Hold up. Okay, I'm sorry about that. I can improve it, but it might, it might, uh, this might make it worse. I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try to make the, the audio a little better. Okay. All right. So, what can we know about this era? The era of the Tanaim and the era of the Amayroim. So, after Korban Bayesheni, of course is the later stages of the Tanaim. And after the Tanaim, we have the era in mostly in Bavel, but also to a degree in Eretz Yisrael of the Amai Rhyme. So what do we know from the from the evidence that we have from various Mishnayas from all over, from all over Shas and from all over the from all over the Mishnah and Teseftos? What do we know exactly happened during that time? I just want to teach everybody a word here. Um, this is an important word. Retroject. This is a historical word. Uh, it's used by historians, and it means to project backwards. And this is a very common mistake that people make, where they take their modern understandings of how tefillah works or what tefillah is, and they project it on the past. So if you understand that, for example, um, tefillah means that everybody gets together in, in, in a single base Knesset, and then they say the Birchus Kriyashma, uh, they say Psyuk de Zirma, and then Kriyashma, and then, and then Shemayin Esri all together, you're going to project that on the previous generations and say, oh, so when the Gemara says X, Y, Z, it must mean that they were doing this Pitzibur, or that they were doing this um, in the order that's in my mind, but or in the manner which is in my mind. This is a such a common mistake. And Google is is being a little anti-Semitic here. I'm, I'm kidding. But on the bottom, you see here their their, their reference for for a, a classical retrojection is the rabbinic interpretation is retrojected into the biblical text, meaning that they're accusing the rabbis of being very of commonly doing retrojection. So, what do we know for sure from these gemaras? Let's 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 not retroject anything. Let's let's not use our conceptions of the sitter as it is today. What do we know for sure existed in those times? As far as Shachars is 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 concerned, we know for sure the Shemayin Esrei existed in the time of the Tanaim. We don't know historically if all the people were saying the Shemayin Esrei. We don't know if the masses were doing it, but the Rabbanim were definitely saying the Rabbanim and the people who were educated were definitely saying a Shemayin Esrei every day. We also know that the Kriyashma and Brachis before and after definitely existed. We do not know that those were appended to Shemayin Esrei until later. We don't have any evidence that of Smichus Gula Latfila until later. We do not know for sure that there was a liturgy that had Kriyashma and its Brachis and then Shemayin Esrei one after the other until later. That's that's an important thing to note. Psuke de Zimra, we don't have evidence until uh, we don't have evidence of Psuke de Zimra until much later. Uh, it's called um, uh, Halal B'chol Yaim, right? This is one of the uh, what, one of the gemaras that we're going to have to see when we when we come to Psuke de Zimra. We don't have evidence in the time of the Tanoim that Psuke de Zimra was said. We only have evidence that Psuke de Zimra was said in the time of the Amayrim. Let's move a little further. Arvit. Whether or not Meir was a chayva or a shus, that's a famous story. This is already in the Mishnayis. Whether or not people prayed Arvit was a big controversy between Rabbi Gamliel and Rabbi Yeshua. Eventually, the halacha was that, no, we pass him like, like Rabbi Yeshua. It's a shus. You don't have to daven Arvit. But the mini Yisrael is, across almost everybody in Chal Yisrael, that we do do Arvit. So we know for sure, Shachrit, Mincha, Arvit, all three were in existence at the time of the Tanaim Amoraim. When it comes to Tfilah B'Tzibor, uh, that we don't know so well. We have a story in the Gemara in, in, in Brachot of Zayin Ubet, where Rabbi Nachman is asked by Rabbi Yitzchak, why didn't you come to Shul? He's like, well, I couldn't. Uh, Rashi's like, oh, Rashi doesn't understand why. He said, well, I couldn't make it. Rashi says, uh, I was sick. She's like, oh, well, we could have brought a minyan to your house. And he says, no, I didn't want to bother people bringing minyan to my house. He's And he says, he says, no, we really could. He presses him like, why didn't you daven with a minyan? He's like, why is davening with a minyan so important? Rav Nachman asks Rabbi Yitzchak, why is davening to, with a minyan so important? And he has to then go ahead and bring him a pasuk to tell him why davening with a, with a minyan is important. So we see in the time of the Meirayim, clearly not all the Meirayim agreed that davening with a minyan, davening b'tzibur was important. This only, ha- this only came to its full formulation during the fourth 
century, in the time of Rabbi Nachman Bar Yitzchak. So we also know from internal evidence in the Gemaras that there were various readings for various brachot, and there were various versions of various brachot. Sometimes one was chosen over the other. We have this explicitly in brachot many times. The Gemara prefers one version over the other. And sometimes, like is usual with Papa, we say all of them, just like in Ashiyatsa, Rafe Chobasar, Umafli Lasais, right? We say both, like if Papa instructs us to. Sometimes we say both of them. Um, therefore, we see that there is a fluidity in that time where even the Gemara recognizes that there were various versions of the brachis in their time. We lastly have evidence in the time of the Amirayim of embellishing and shortening Shemayin Esrei. There's a Gemara by, I believe it's Rabbi Yezer, where one of his Talmidim would get up and say a shorter Shemayin Esrei, one of the Talmidim would get up and say a longer Shemayin Esrei. We see in their time that the Shemayin Esrei was fluid. Was there a statutory text that people were allowed to embellish or shorten? That's another Shailah. But we definitely know we definitely know for sure that the Shemayin Esrei was fluid. Now, from our perspective, we, we're here in 20, 2023. This time of, of fluidity must seem like chaos. Like, what's going on? We have almost 200 years from the time of Rabbi Gamliel all the way until the end of the Amirayim, where there's a tremendous fluidity, a tremendous amount of evolution that's happening to shape Jewish liturgy, um, to, to start beginning to shape a Seder Hatfila, to start beginning to shape a Jewish liturgy. Now, what happens when we end the period of the Amirayim? So this is at the beginning of the 6th century, right? The early 500s. From this point on, from the early 500s, all the way to around the year 750, to the, to the mid-8th century, we have very little to no information about what Tfila looked like anywhere in Kali Yisrael. And you might wonder to yourself, well, why not? What, what, why is the, why, why are the dark ages so dark? On the one hand, you could understand why after the fall of Rome in the Christian era, in the Christian empire, um, nations, a lot of people were illiterate. There was a lot of, uh, lack of technology in many areas, but for the Jews, most of the Jews were educated and literate in this time. Why is it that between the, the sixth century and the eighth century, we have so little literary output from um, from Jewish communities during that time. So one reason, besides the taboo of writing Teresh Shabal Peh, one reason for the tremendous um, downturn of that era in the 500s and the 600s is what I'm showing you here on the screen, and I'm not kidding, a volcano. There was a massive volcanic eruption in the year 536 and again in 540 and again in 547 not just one possibly in Iceland and also in El Salvador but possibly according to the geological record we have records of volcanoes exploding also in the Americas what this created was what was called a little antique late ice age <clears throat> and they really should have taught all of us about all of us about this in history class but this set off a chain of events which literally destroyed the planet. If you thought a few days ago in New York City was freaky, you should have been alive in the year 536. It's famously known as the worst year to be alive. In that year, they were blanketed by dark skies for 18 months. This set off a chain of events like uh, crop failures all over the planet, mass starvation, mass malnutrition, Many people were deprived of food and vitamin D because of the lack of sunlight. And it's estimated that across many of the of the uh, organized empires, almost 50% of humanity perished. This was an awful, absolutely horrible time to be alive. And not just was there a, um, and this is, let me just show you here on the screen. This is the Byzantine Empire at, 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 under Justinian and the Sassanid Empire. These empires saw humongous amounts of death and 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 um, destabilization to their economy because of this of these eruptions and all of the plagues that that came after the eruption. The volcanoes caused, uh, first of all, malnutrition. So many people were starving, and also because people were starving and they were vitamin D deficient, and it was cold. Um, Rats came indoors, there was a bubonic plague, and hence we have Justinian's plague. And so, so, so many people died. So the next 100 years for humanity was really, really, really miserable. It's a miracle that Justinian, as, as a very effective emperor, 
was able to maintain stability in his empire during this time. Historians are very cautious about this time. They say, yeah, it was a bad century, but not every year was dark. Not every year had crop failures. Still, it took literally 100 years until um, it, it, the geologists found evidence that the economy recovered. What am I saying by geologists? I mean that seriously. If you look back in the ice record, um, back to the year, if you drill down to, to the year, <laughs> drill down through the ice in Antarctica to the year um, 536, you see all the soot from the volcanoes and it goes all the way until the year 640 that you find evidence of lead in the air. Lead in the air means that people are starting to make coins again. The economy was so shot for those, those 100 years that the... The economy was so shot that that nobody had a need for manufacturing coins until the year 640. So when we don't have literary output from the Jewish people and the Jewish communities who were a minority in these empires during that time, it's because life was absolutely miserable and everybody was just trying to survive. So from the year 640 onwards is, a, is an era of about uh, 110 years of development until our first clues about the tefillah come back to us. And our first clues about the tefillah come back to us in the Chuvas of Rabbi Yehudai Gaon, who lived in the 750s. The Chuvas of Rabbi Yehudai Gaon are where he replies to people asking across the empires different shilas and tefillah, where he replies in the negative or in the positive, which shows that by his time in the 750s, the yeshivas in Babel had standardized prayer. This, the 750s, if you were coming to this year for an answer for when we have the earliest evidence of a Seder had tefillah, the earliest evidence we have is from Rebbe Yehudai Gaon in the 750s. Why? Because he assumes that the yeshivas have a standardized, correct way of davening that he can therefore enforce and instruct all the communities under his reach, which are mostly, um, but not entirely, under the Sassanid Empire. He also had areas in Egypt. He also had areas um, in Syria and etc. Okay, so now let's get down. Now that we've discussed the earliest evidence we have for a Seder Hatfila, which is in the 750s. Next, we have to next thing we have to do is discuss the book. When did the book, the physical paper of the Seder, begin to occur? So now the Jewish tradition places a huge taboo on writing down Tarsh of Pep. There's an asmachta that tells us, if I'm not correct, an asmachta that tells us that it is usher, that it is usher to write down Tarsh Shabal Peh. And therefore, with this halachic understanding, the Jewish people very rarely wrote down anything besides um, Tarsh of Sav. And Tarsh of Sav, or the five books of Moses and the prophets, were typically written on parchment. They were written on, you know, on animal hide, on leather, and for this reason, most of the texts from Jews in that period were in parchment. But when it came to Tara Shabal Peh, everybody had to memorize everything. And this is something that sounds crazy to us today. But in the medieval times and earlier, if you were a scholar, most of your bag of tricks, just like a magician, were mnemotechnical or mnemonic devices. If you were going to become a scholar, you had to learn how to memorize massive volumes of text. And there are contests today for people who do this with memory palaces and whatnot, because today there's a resurgence in this art. But in medieval times and in the Dark Ages, this was crucial to learning Tarsh Shabal Peh. You had to be a memorizer. If you look in the Gemaras, every time it says, Tana, ta, Tani Tana Lefnei Rabbi, Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Lazar. Whenever it says a Tana said in, in front of Rabbi, Rabbi Elazar or or any somebody like that, Rabbi Echanan, what that means is a person who's ex, who is an expert in memorizing brisas said this in front of this rabbi because there were people in the yeshiva whose job it was to memorize certain volumes of text. So for a long time, Torah Shabal Peh was only taught and only retained because of Jewish law. It was only retained in people's brains and they memorized to the T vast volumes of text. Now, the consequences of this are huge because this centralizes rabbinic authority and it centralizes rabbinic knowledge. Without having a rabbi, without having the knowledge of the Talmud and having the knowledge and training on how to interpret the Talmud and, and to paskin from a Gemara, you could not be a rabbi, nor could you have power. Therefore, the yeshivas in Babel and the yeshivas in Eretz Yisrael managed to centralize their power. When Jews did write, it was usually 
um, on wax ta tablets, which I'm showing here on the screen. A wax tablet is exactly as it sounds. One side, there's this uh, wooden thing here with, if you're listening on the audio, it's like a, it's like a, a wooden book. And uh, inside of it is is wax, and you write on it with one, one side of like a pen like side. The other side has like a like a shovel side where you where you wipe out um, anything that you were temporarily writing. In Roman times, Greek times, writing tablets were ubiquitous. Everybody used these as like carry on notebooks. They would write into wax. They would erase, write into wax, and then disc and then and then um, you know wipe the the slate clean, the tabula rasa, when they needed to to start over. So. This is what Jews would would mostly use in that period. There is a theory um, ba um, advanced by Professor Stefan Reif that, or Reif, I don't know, I don't know how to pronounce his name. Um, he has a theory based on on some other research that the Jews took a much longer time to start using the Codex, and this had a major effect on whether or not a Siddur would ever be written. You got to understand that for the Christians, they had no, they had no uh, uh, religious compunctions or reservations about any type of writing technology. For them, whatever worked worked. So when somebody had the bright idea of taking folios of vellum or paper, stacking them, and then taking two hardcovers and putting it together to call what we today call a book, they just did it immediately. Oh, they're like, they were like, oh, that's that, that's so useful. Why don't we why don't we do that too? And the Christians were using books or codexes for a very long time. But the Jews didn't start using codexes until the end of the first millennium. And this is this is separate research. There's a book called The Birth of the Codex, where it's not a Jewish author, not a Jewish study, but Reef brings it to bring a raya that the Jews didn't actually start writing books until the end of the first millennium, until the 700s, 800s. Now, the problem with writing books, of course, is that once Jews start writing down Teresh of Peh, this changes everything. This changes the centrality of authority, the centrality of knowledge. How are the rabbis going to control the interpretation of the Talmud when, every, when any rich bloke can go ahead and commission himself a codex and he could get a Talmud written for himself and he could paskin and he could go ahead. So th this caused a decentralization of knowledge. This caused a huge shift in power in the, the end of the first millennium. However, just like the, the church with the, with the printing press, the Gainim and the Yeshivas and Bavel moved very quickly to assert control over codices. Once they realized that books were being published, whether you know, the manuscripts, of course, they were being handwritten. Once they realized that Tarsh was beginning to be written, the Ga'inim moved quickly to go in and fill that void. And so the first Svarim we have um, in that era, like for, from the Bahag and similar, and many, many Chuvais came in those forms, and they were distributed as codices because the Ga'inim were trying to maintain control. When a, a redaction of, let's say, Talmud Babli was printed, it had to be done under the authority of the yeshiva with the stamp of the yeshiva. If someone was going to publish a Talmud Babli, it had to be stamped by the yeshiva, that the yeshiva uh, was the, were the ones who were going to, to approve this copy of Gemara. It was a very, very interesting time to be alive during this shift between Teresh Valpeh and, and uh, Teresh Valpeh literally and Teresh Valpeh figuratively. Now, the Siddur has its own peculiarities because the Siddur, there's a, a, an explicit Gemara which says you're not supposed to write, write down brachas. So, because you're not supposed to write down brachas at all, you're not supposed to write down tefillahs for halachic reasons because it might get burned on a fire on Shabbos, it took even longer for Sidurim to become standardized. And the earliest things we have that we could even call Sidurim are not Sidurim at all. And let's there's a book by Lawrence Hoffman called The Canonization of the Synagogue Service, where he goes through a lot of a lot of the detail of this of this uh, evolution. The first thing, the first era we have here is Rabbi Hudaigon. As I said, as I said, we have him responding to a lot of a, a lot of um, a, a lot of questions about about Tila, both negative and positive. Then we have the first, let me just review with you, the first um, proper prayer books, or the first proper Siddharim that were published. So the loophole that the Ga'inim used to publish Siddharim was very simple. If you were writing a, a book of a halacha, it didn't really matter if, if, the, um, if it had brachis in it. Once you were writing a book of a halacha, it would matter-of-factly also include the nusach of the brachis. So this was a loophole that the Ga'inim used in order to publish prayer texts without having to actually publish proper Sidurim. The first 
uh, example we have of any of the Gainim doing this was Rav Natronai Gaon. I'm holding here the Chuvas of Rav Natronai Gaon from the Ofek Institute. Rav Natronai Gaon was not asked for a siddur. Rav Natronai Gaon was asked about a, a Gemara, which says that we are chayiv to say 100 brachas every day. Can our great esteemed rabbi please tell us what does it mean to say 100 brachas every day? What are those 100 brachas? Can you count them for us? And so he replied with a letter with accounting, and he goes all the way from Birchas Shahar through uh, Pesukah de Zimra and through Shemayin Esrei, and he counts all the brachas that people say through the day. And just um, inadvertently, by coincidence, from this letter, we we gain his order of a liturgy, and we see that Rav Natronai Gain has has a real uh, liturgy. We, we're missing parts of it. Don't get me wrong. If you look at the actual manuscript, you'll see you'll see <laughs> we're just missing a lot of parts of this letter. But Rav Natronai Gain is the first example of of a seder, so to speak, being written down. The next thing we have is the seder of Amram Gaon. Rav Amram Gaon was asked by a community in Spain, either Lucena, Barcelona, Christian Spain, Muslim Spain, we don't know. But Rav Amram Gaon was asked by a community in Spain, can you please instruct us on the seder Hatilas and the seder of Haggadah Shal Pesach? And a couple of, they had a couple of questions, a couple of inquiries. And so Rav Amram Gaon said, very well, I will send you a seder and, and a halacha book, a codex, sanctioned by the yeshiva, this is how you pray. Rabbi Amram Gaon's Seder had an unbelievable um, effect because it took the Nusach HaBavli in contradistinction to the Nusach HaYushalmi, and it made sure that the Nusach HaBavli was the main halachic authoritative text for all Jews. Every single Jew alive today is... is, is, is um, is is uh, reading a prayer or or davening according to the Nusach HaBavli. The Nusach HaYushalmi, which uh, grew parallel to the Nusach HaBavli, went extinct in the 11th century, thanks to, to already by the 11th century, thanks to Rav Amram Gaon's uh, force of this of this seder, the seder of Amram Gaon. So many communities in Spain copied it and recopied it. It, it, it traveled all the way to Germany, traveled to North Africa. Every community in the world got a copy of seder of Amram Gaon. The problem was. That so many people copied it and turned it into a sitter uh, in, in a bit of a cheating way that they added their own local customs and they added their own notes. They added things and deleted things. So the Seder of Amargon that we have today is woefully, woefully inaccurate. The best version of it that we have is a critical edition by Rabbi Daniel Goldschmidt, rabbi professor, a philologist. And he did a terrific job of trying to get to the most, uh, the best version of the Seder of Amargon that we could possibly get. Again, it's still woefully lacking. But it's the best we could do because it's probably impossible unless you have a time machine to go back in time. The next we have Rav Sadia Gaon, who had a similar question from Egypt, his uh, hometown. And with his own influences, some of them are a little bit Yushalmi. He also sends a Siddur, but the Siddur is primarily the Nusach HaBavli. And this, again, um, codifies and enforces that the that the Shemayin Esrei and the major brachas, which are the Nusach HaBavli, became the standard in all of Chai Yisrael. Lastly, we have the Roshir and of Haigain, who responded to many Shilas in the late 900s and the early 11th century, the, the, eight, the late 10th century, the early 11th century, these are these these Gainim also had a major part to play. Now, in this book, uh, Hoffman wants to periodize. He wants to say that there are three distinct periods in the time of the Gainim. So when we canonize this liturgy, all the way from the time of, of um, Rabbi Hudai Gain, all the way to Rabbi Hai Gain, at the end of the time of the Gainim, there's three different periods. The first period, the 8th through 9th century, when the Gainim are responding to Shailas and Shubas and they are fixing the liturgy, their primary goal is to is to um uh to rep uh what's the word deprecate the Nusa Hayushalmi. Most of the Chubas are anti Nusa Hayushalmi Chubas. And in this period, according to Hoffman, uh, Rabbi, Hudai, Rabbi Hudai Gain had a lot more power. The Gainim had a lot more power in that era, and therefore they used it to combat the Nusach Yushami, which they saw as false and incredible, like it didn't have any credibility. The truth is it had credibility from the Nusach Yush, from the Talmud Yushami, but that wasn't valid in their view. So that's how he sees the first period. The second period of canonization, he sees it as being between the 9th and 10th century, where Rav Natronai and, and, and Rav Amram are coming against the the Karayim. And because the Karayim were trying to develop their own Nuschais, the Ga'inim were a little bit more flexible, but the, most of their polemics and most of their canonization comes to combat Karayism, especially Rav Sadia Ga'in. Rav Sadia Ga'in is very anti-Karay. 
And his main agenda in his Siddur is to correct grammar and to correct halacha and to correct karayim. Lastly, you have the 10th and 11th centuries with Rav Hai and Rav Shira. By that point, the yeshivas in Babel had lost a lot of their power. So we notice in the Chuvais a lot more liberalism. The, the Gainim were happy were, were happy enough to be asked to Shaila because there were so many other centers of learning, so many other big Rabbanim that the Gainim were happy enough to be asked. As long as the Gainim in Babel were being consulted and ask, being asked for a psak, um, that was good enough for them. So they would use the authority of their office and the stamp of their approval to approve even a schleis that weren't so in with the way the yeshiva did it. But as long as it was kosher lahalacha, they were going to allow it. So that's so much for the history of the canonization during the Gaonic times. Now, let's discuss a little further, just lastly for the book, what happens when we get to the manuscripts. So I'm going to stop my share for a second. Let's just go back to um, my uh, my face, but I'll share, I'll share it again in a second. So what happens from the Gonic era till the medieval era, to, until till the medieval era? So what happens is that many of the, many of the seders, the halachic seders that were created by the Rabbanim turned into people creating their own sitters. We have people that began to commission out of necessity a sitter for the kahal. Most of what we see in the era of the, uh, I'm trying to get to a page here, hold on, give me a second. Most of what we see in the era of the of the Rishinim is people would write sidurim when it was absolutely necessary. So they would write, um, typically machzayim, they would write um, they would write a piyutim. They would write a whole collection of tefillahs when it was necessary because people would forget it. In the time of the Roshonim, it was, it was expected and understood that people should memorize the weekday prayers and the Berch Samazin and all the, all the typical things. But when it came to things that weren't usual in the time of the Roshonim, those were already allowed to be written down. The problem was uh, vellum, paper, even parchment was was pretty expensive. So it was typically only rich people or synagogues and communities that commissioned writing Sudurim or writing Machzairim. The benefit to this is that, and uh, give me a second to pull this up for you. I really do want to do this. Um, I have this under Svarim and I have a folder called Old Sudurim, believe it or not. And I hope I can pull this up for you. A whole collection, the digital Budleian um, yeah, I'm going to share my screen now, if I can. Let's see. This is useful for everybody on YouTube. Uh, share screen. And Budleian. Here we go. So if you if you browse any major library in the world, uh, like the Budleian, the Oxford Library, uh, Library of Congress, any major world library, the Berlin University, and you just search for the word Sitter, or you search for the word Machsar, you are going to find dozens, if not hundreds, of Machsarim from the Middle Ages. Most, the earliest stuff we typically see is from like the 13th or the 12th century, but we definitely find many, many machzayrim from that era. And the reason is obvious because more machzayrim, since the holiday prayers, people couldn't be expected to remember by heart. The piyutim people couldn't be expected to remember by heart. So we have many more machzayrim and some full machzayrim, like meaning the full cycle of the entire year, which include a siddur as well. Now, because paper and vellum was expensive, that meant that you usually had to consult a rabbi when you were going to write a machsar or you were going to write a siddur. And therefore, many of those texts are very helpful for later periods because the primary writers, the scribes who wrote these siddurim, typically had a rabbi consulting them and they usually represent a body of halacha. They usually represent a, um, they usually represent some form of, of authority and a proper nusach. When we move on to the late to the, to the modern era, and already in the late 15th century, and the printing press becomes a thing, that's when the world changes uh, five times over. So obviously, well, let me just share my screen. When the printing press uh, was invented with Gutenberg in the 1440s, 1450s, the world changed in a million ways. <clears throat> but one of the many ways in which it changed was that it changed Jewish scholarship forever because of the ubiquity of Sfarim. Now, Jews were not really allowed to own printing presses. 
most of the printing presses in the world were in major cities or in Italy or in Germany, places that were controlled tightly both by the governments and by the church. So Jews typically weren't allowed to own printing houses. They, you would need a license to own a, a printing house. You would only be allowed to do certain jobs. So if Jews were going to operate print houses, typically they were doing so by borrowing, renting, or apprenticing by a Christian print house. One of the miracles of of the Gemara's survivability is that Christian Hebraists, meaning Christian scholars who were experts in Hebrew, took a fascination with the Gemara. And therefore, the Christians were very willing to sponsor and to approve and to allow for the printing of the Gemara in Christian printing presses. That's just one of the miracles of the time of, of that it happened to be at this time, Christian Hebraists got very interested in the Talmud. Regardless, Jewish print shops uh, sprung up uh, one after the other. Very often there were problems in printings, but the first uh, printing of a sitter ever was the printing of the Sonsino sitter in the year 1486. I believe it was done by um, Gershom um, Sonsino. Let me see if I have the right page up uh, over here. Yeah, here it is. So this is a this is a an original. You could buy this in Sotheby's. I think somebody bought this for $72,000. This was an original Machsor Lubinei Roma, a Machsor which was according to the Minog of, of um, the Kiles of Rome. And he published this. He had trouble in one city. He had to leave the other city. He finally finished this in, Cas I think it's called Casala Maiore or some city in Italy. And he finished this, this uh, first printed book. And it's an extremely important um uh, printed work because it was just honestly, yeah, it says on the bottom there, Casale Maiore, 1485-1486. A, a really beautiful, very important book, especially if you're going to study this bibli bibliographically, like how the books developed. This was the first full-on, straight-up printed Siddur. This didn't mean that overnight everybody had Siddurim. Remember, these things were really expensive. Even the, the printers could not just print whatever they wanted to. It was a matter of money. Printing was really expensive, and the only uh, orders that were going to be considered were going to be very large orders. It wasn't worth it for the, the print house to even try to make a profit on something that wasn't going to be a large order. Therefore, in this era, we have a situation where the Sidurim switch from being a domain that is controlled by scribes and rabbis to being controlled by businessmen and printers. And whether or not a sitter could be profitable or not made or broke uh, how exactly and what exactly was going to be in a sitter and how the nusach was going to be laid out. Of course, there were rabbinical consultants involved, but the printers had a lot more power because they were set to decide um, what was going to go in the sitter and what was not based on would it sell or not, especially after in the period after the um, expulsion, the the what was it called? The um, Alhambra decree. When all the Jews left Spain, there were, as at least the way uh, Leopold Sons puts it, he says there was 14 different communities of Spain smushed into Greece and Salonika. You had one city, again, I mean, Jews went everywhere, but just as an, as an example, you had 14 different Jewish cities, uh, 14 different Jewish cities represented with 14 different Uschot smushed together in Saloniki or Salonika. It just, and that's not including the the native Greek nusach that they were that they were doing the Romaniot nusach in Salonika. So you have fifteen different people competing for the correct siddur and the correct nusach to to pray. So when they want to create a siddur for Salonika for the Sfaradim, what does that mean? People, you have people from Castilla, you have people from Aragon, you have people from Catalonia. Um, the, every province in Spain and even Portuguese Jews were represented in Saloniki. Eventually, the Portuguese Jews. Therefore, we have a problem which the printers have to address from a profitability perspective. How are we going to make money? Therefore, many of the print shops, at least when it comes to the Svaradim, many of the print shops defaulted to the Castilian Nusach. And I'm, I hope I'm still sharing my screen here. Yeah, I am. This here is the famous Siddur Reish Pedalid, the Siddur that the, that the Arizal himself used. Uh, this was a popular Siddur for the Minhag B'nai Svarad because it kept the Nusach Castilla, the Nusach of like 
the New York of Spain, Castile, where most of the richest, most powerful, edu most educated Jews were from. The Minha Castilla was a very pure Nusak. It had the fewest embellishments, the fewest the fewest anomalies. And therefore, the printers were like, you know what? Of all these different Nusakhot, we're just going to print a very clean version of Minha Castilla. And we're going to see how many sells, <laughs> how many of them sell. This Siddur Reish Pedal had sold quite well. And this was one of the first um, important Ashkenaz Sidurim. The, uh, sorry, Svaradi Sidurim. The Ashkenazim had, of course, their own Sidurim, which were printed in Germany, printed in Poland. As the 16th century moved on, there were many, 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 many Sidurim printed everywhere for the Western European Jews, for the Eastern European Jews. Today, and this is just an illustration here at the Kotel, when you go to the Kotel, you will find a table full of 650 different Sidurim whether it's Nusach Ashkenaz, whether it's Nusach Sfard, whether it's Nusach Sfardi, Nusach Temani, Nusach Minhag Bnei Roma, all of these printings and later printings have their own complicated history. So it would exhaust us to the end of the earth to go through every single every single uh, Nusach, through every single development in the in the era of the Siddur. As we approach every tefillah throughout this series, we're going to discuss how that, that tefillah developed throughout history and how that developed in different regions. Because wherever Jews lived, they had a siddur, they had a nusach. And so to go through every single nusach and to go through every single siddur that was ever printed is literally to go through the entirety of Jewish history in one class. We simply cannot do it. Therefore, we will leave the study of specific sidurim and specific nuschais to the rightful place. One notable exception I'll, I'll give is because this is just one that's asked a lot of me is what's with the Nusachari and what happened with Nusach Svard. So very, in very basic terms, originally there were predominantly Western European Nusachais from, uh, from the Ashkenaz and there were predominantly Svardi Nusachais from Spain. Those were the predominant uh, Nusachs. Um, I would say at the time, 70% of Jews dive in one of those two Nusachais. Then... Um, the, when the Ari, Arizal came onto the scene, he introduced a whole lot of Kabbalistic ideas into Judaism. The Arizal himself never changed the Siddur. The Arizal himself was an extreme conservative. He didn't like any ideas of changing the Siddur. And it seems from most of his writings in the Shara Kavanas that his instructions for Tefillah seem to be only to his disciples. It doesn't seem that he wants everybody to stand for Vibarach David. You know what I mean? It, it seems like most of his contributions to the Seder HaTefillah are for his disciples, but his edits on the Nusach HaTfilah are extremely minor. Usually the, the, the Arizal never changes Nusach HaTfilah. He only prefers one Nusach over the other or one Tfilah over the other. He doesn't use, he, he just uses the Siddur Pedal like everybody else. That's what his Rav Chaim Vital testifies. He says, I saw my Rebbe using the Siddur Pedal like everybody else. And, you know, he made one or two different preferences, one or two different changes, but very, very few. Um, this this work was done by somebody whose name is, escapes me. He made a he made a set called Birchas Rifal with the Siddur Reish Pedalid, which was only found a few years ago, a few decades ago, and then a Siddur Hari, which he reproduced from the Arizal's from the Arizal's writing in Shara Kavanis, what how the Arizal would have daven accurately. When the Hasidim began be, began to take us in an extreme interest in Kabbalah, especially after the time of the Baal Shem Tov and the Magid and the Balatanya. They began searching for a way to homogenize the the nusach of Ashkenaz with the nusach of um, with the nusach of the Ari, so to speak, with the Sfardi nusach. They wanted to daven more correctly, and therefore, so many different um, nuschais were born, and different rebbes started modifying the nusach Ashkenaz to be more like the nusach Sfardi. But very few of them just switched over to nusach Sfardi entirely. That caused a huge controversy. Eventually, I, in my opinion, the best of all these Nusacharis, which are not really Nusachari, is probably the Balatina, because the Balatina was a was an extremely uh, huge Paisek. He was a giant of a Paisek. He was a giant uh, of Kabbalah, and he took what he believed to be the, the Arizal's opinions, as long as, as well as his halachic opinions, his own halachic opinions, and he put them in together as a he put them together as a single sitter. So, if you want to study a sitter which is halachically correct. And mostly from a Nusach point of, of view is Ashkenazically correct as well. I would recommend study uh, using the Nusachari of, of, of the Balatanya. Most of the other Nusach Sfarad, so to speak, are complete, and I say this with kindness, train wrecks. If you look at a Hasidic Siddur, a Nusach Sfarad Siddur, whether it's Ashkenaz or 
or uh, sorry, whether it's Art Scroll or some other brand of Nusach Svarad, when it comes to halachic consistency, when it comes to Nusach consistency, Nusach Svarad, as it's advertised today, is a complete, utter train wreck when it comes to Nusach. It has a lot of halachic flaws, it has a lot of nus- a, a lot of Messira flaws, and therefore I would strongly not recommend people pray uh, Nusach Svarad, unless, of course, your Rebbe says so, and that's how you do things. Uh, please um, understand that the Nusach Svarad does not represent Nusach Arizal. The Arizal never had a Nusach. There is a s- one and a half pages in the Shara Kavanas where it says um, the Nusach Atfila Le Rabbeinu Hari, where he describes all the changes. You can look at it yourself and you'll understand how little the Arizal changed, if anything. The Arizal was a huge conservative. He did not like changing the tefillah whatsoever. So the general history is, of course, we had the two, let, let's just recap. We had the Seder tefillah gets developed from the Tanaim and Amirayim all the way to the year 750. That's the first year that we have any we have any evidence of canonization. In the year 750 onwards from the Gainim, we find a strong preference of the Gainim to enforce their version or their Nusach HaTfila in contradistinction to the Nusach Yushami, because there were two main schools at that time. There was the Talmud Bavli, Talmud Yushami, and they had their own Nusach HaTfila. The Nusach Bavli won out. That, that was the one that won. This took over, and the Nusach Bavli spread from, from uh, Iraq, of course, from northern Mesopotamia. It spread to, we have, um, what do you call it, Western Europe. We have Egypt, Northern Africa, there's there's the Middle East, there's Eretz Yisrael. The Nusach Bavli eventually took over, and that, uh, through broken telephone and through various uh, episodes of migration, to put it simply, through throughout Jewish history, migrated into very many different forms of uh, Nusachis as we have them today. There are some, you know, old extinct Nusachis that still maintain elements of the Nusach Yushalmi, that, that that's still extinct. There are still hints of the Nusach Yushalmi in the modern tefillah, but for the for the most part, the Nusach Yushalmi is extinct. And what we're left with today is a body of variation in tefillah and in Nusachis of Siddur, which basically represents Jewish history. The Siddur is an anthology of Jewish history as much as it is an anthology of Judaism itself. So with that, we will leave we will leave off our class on the Siddur, the early history of the Siddur, the background of the Siddur. And when it comes to specific Nusrais, if it comes to specific um, questions that anybody has regarding uh, every tefillah and every part of the Siddur, we will approach that as we get there. So